exhale on air, but. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to Unreasonable Doubt, along with my favorite friends, Mr. Judge Franklin Bynum. Hello. Hey, I'm back. Yeah, I'm back. Our producer extraordinaire, Mr. Justin Harris. Hi, thanks for dragging me out. And the smartest one in the group today, ladies and Easily gentlemen, Mrs. Down. Sarah V. Wood. How's it going? Another Glad week, another week at the courthouse. We got a judge, trial warrior, upper lever PD. Let's talk about and some- me. I said trial warrior. warrior. Yeah, oh, you, no, yeah. No. yeah. You, I heard you got a big not guilty this week. Oh, a little not guilty on like a trumped up traffic ticket racing case. Oh, you mean oh, you just- Oh, I heard about, about a not guilty case. on a race? Yeah, way to go. Yeah, oh. what was that about? Did they do the they horns? Just, it was awesome. Like the video looked really bad for us. I mean, it looked really bad. And the jury completely restored my faith in this whole process because we went back there and talked to them and they were they looked at the prosecutor like we did exactly what you said we wrote out every one of the elements and then we weighed all the evidence for each element and we think he was probably racing but we didn't think it rose to beyond a reasonable doubt wow. did you use wow. a, I was like did you use a chart in your either voir dire or closing i didn't like a, the the stair step chart no i didn't and i was impressed by the we talked about it but i didn't use like a visual it and i was really impressed by this jurors um, have you seen, how was your makeup of your veneer panel? And did you feel like it was old, young? It was interesting. So it was, I had 30 on the panel. I had three African-Americans. Um, I had an, I think an, a slightly over representation of the county on Asian Americans, under representation on African-Americans and Hispanics. What about whites? Um, whites, I think were over, over, uh, represented because of the low numbers for Hispanics and African Americans. Um, I objected to the veneer panel based on not being representation in the cross section. Um, the judge did you? disagreed with that. The state struck the only two black jurors in the first 15 after the causal strikes. Racist. I, I did a Batson challenge on that. They did were you win any? To, no. I mean, who was presiding? Were, uh, Genesis, judge Genesis Draper. Really? How was she in trial? I have to say, I have tried a case, we picked a jury, we busted the panel, so we didn't get very far, so um, I can't speak for all of the county court judges because I haven't tried a case in front of them, but this was easily the most fair jury trial that I've ever sat through. I mean, she shut me down on things she should have shut me down on. She shut the state down on things that she should have shut them down on. I mean, it was even keel. Before we start talking about judges, let's talk about the panels and people that are coming through. So, uh, judge, you, you see panels, uh, you try cases in your court. Um, are you seeing? Talk to us about the cross sections you've seen. You know, I think that that the 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 trend line is good. You know, as far as we, we're getting more and more representative juries, uh, jury panels, and um, but I would say that we're doing more with 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 what we got. You know, I mean, sure. in the sense that like we. My job as a defense lawyer, right, was like begging and pleading with people to like, please follow the law, right? And it's somewhat different now because my job now is I just get up in front of them and it's like, look, you got to do this, right? If you can't do this, just tell me, but you have to, right? Mm -hmm. I'm up here telling you, you got to do this. So if you can't, let me know. And like, it's, it works, you know, people will, um, people um, do you and, do do you do a or, or do you? I do some. I do less you? and less. I do less and less. You know, I, I want to let the parties honestly take care of it. But I will say, as far as like, you know, having faith in people and, and really, I, I say when I do the, the parts that I do do, I, I say that like say this is <laughs> the part. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> do do um, the parts of the vordire that I that I do. Um, I one of the things I always say is that this is one of the last parts of our democracy that the people mm -hmm. really truly have the power you know directly and it's so directly and it's so important and and i talk about it in terms of like giving my power over to you right y'all are the judges and we rise for the jury in texas right we don't do that in other states um, we rise for the jury because they are the judges of the facts and so we talk about jury selection in terms of um recusal you know if you wouldn't be good for a certain case you know, I, I'll let I'll, I let people know when I'm not good for a case, and you know I expect you to too. Recuse yourself from being a judge in this case, and but but let me say this: 
I've been working real hard on making the jury instructions better. You know, like before they were a text blob, no one really cared, you know, whether they were readable or usable. Been breaking things out, complex ideas, right, into bullet points, right, saying here, you know, a lot of these are confusing issues, right, as far as like, you don't have to be unanimous about the about these two things, right, but you do about the one thing that covers these two things. If you put that into bullet points and, and refer to them as 2A, 2B, people understand that better, at least. And I think that people do the right thing if they have the right instructions. So but, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me ask a question on that. Do you think that when they're not clear and, not, and they're a little bit more confusing, or they use more legalese um, or cumbersome language, um, do you think that benefits one side over the other? I do. If they can't put a thing in, in common terms, and they, then I think it, they're going to lose something. If you're going to put a slide up in front of a veneer panel, you, it better not be cumbersome, and it better be broken down. Right. As you far, better have thought about it. As far as the jury instructions go, though, because that's what's such gibberish. Well, and I, sure. I, on the jury instructions, I think that if you're going to just agree to the form jury um uh, instruction, uh, form jury uh, things that we pull and that are, are used to in Harris County, uh, you might run into some problems. I like to, if I have a special issue or a thing that I need to be in the instruction, I like to have a written out uh, kind of case law backed thing that I can submit. I don't use yeah. the, the Harris County Charge Bank. I mean, just like back Charge it up bank. and explain to the audience of, you know, however many, right? Like, we used to have this thing called the Harris County Charge Bank, which I don't know where it came from, right? But basically, there are instructions given to juries at the end of a jury trial. And we had our own instructions in Harris County for a long time. And I don't know where they came from, again. But I use the state bar jury charges, right? Sure. And, and the thing is, if you go to the book, right, it, it's really like thoughtfully, they're like, well, here, you could include this provision. Here's the case law behind this, or you can not. This is arguable. And it's just much better, much clearer. And then I further break it down. I use a nice font. I try to use a, a nice font. Uh, what do you like? I, I've been using IBM Plex monospace. I'm serious. Uh, but, I, uh, but, Gil Sands is a real good one, too. The Gil Sands, I like that. You get that. more not guilty when you use Gil Sands? Sometimes, the Courier News, I get a little bit more, uh, like, pop to it. Yeah. <laughs> so the best story I ever heard about jury confusion was Somebody went to trial on a case that was just like an absolute loser and they were like, okay, there's just no way that we're going to win. They had to go to trial for some reason. And the jury came back with a not guilty and everybody was just completely shocked and they went back and talked to the jury afterward and the jury was like, well, um, you know, every time you said objection and the judge said overruled, we knew that we weren't supposed to consider any of that evidence. <laughs> so we followed the rules. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me ask. And of Harry. course, the funny part of that is, is that overruled means that they that the question was fine as, as far as the judge is concerned, and they can answer the question, right? And the, the jury ju can consider that. Jury had it completely backwards. Yeah. Do it's you so try? important. It's so important to to explain that flow of the trial as it's happening. You know. So, I find that I this is a basic courtesy and, and maybe more more kind or accommodating to civilian witnesses than police witnesses, right? That I'm like, oh, thank you for your testimony today. Or, 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 or the other way, I had a police officer once like offer his hand up as he left the stand in front of the jury and if, reflexively, I just offer my hand back. Oh, yeah, thank you so much for coming. And But every time I do anything like that, like thank you for coming to a civilian or shaking the hand of a police officer, I'm, I always think to look at them and be like, hey, you know, if, if I give courtesies to a witness, if, if I exchange some pleasantries, like that's not me making any comment on what they just said. It's just me trying to be like a kind and courteous person, right? And you're not to like really consider that for anything. And I think that like I am, juries often complain that we get the instructions at the end. And it's like that is a bad way of doing things. But I explain it to them in terms of that, which are correct, which I don't know what the instructions are until Plays the out. end. It plays out. But there are some intermediate things that I can slip in that are not at all objectionable that can let them understand what's happening. And I try to I try to slip those in when I can. Well, I want to before you jump on. I want to read a portion of a jury charge instruction 
that I think we may have all heard before. And this is one that I've really been starting having some problems with. Before I do, let's like real briefly explain. At the end of a jury trial, the jury's about to get the case and the judge has a set, and they're, you know, eight, 10, 12, 20 pages long of written instructions of the law and everything that the, that the jury's supposed to go back and be able to use as a rubric, right? So it tells them everything about the definitions of the, the terms. It tells them what they can consider, what they can't consider, how to consider things, how to apply things. If there's a special issue like self-defense, it applies that for them, right? So this is some language that I started having some problems with. And it says, this is under the section about evidence. It says, evidence consists of testimony and exhibits admitted into trial and tells them what evidence is and what they consider. It goes on and says, statements made by the lawyers are not evidence. You heard this before? Mm -hmm. The questions asked by the attorneys are not evidence. I have a big problem with that because as defense attorneys like you and me, JV and Sarah, our questions are most of the time are in cross-examination, right? Right? Mm -hmm. And what's the answer to a, cro to a well-crafted cross-examination question? Of one yes letter? Or no. Yes or no, right? Uh, and I know that Judge Bynum may not be able to mention much about this because this issue might come up in front of him if somebody objects to it. So feel free to jump in where you can, but I direct this to the people who feel like they can't answer. I just, I feel like okay that was with written. It. I'm okay with that. But if, if the jury gets back there and they're like, well, wait, we can't consider what the defense attorney said because those, everything the attorneys say are not evidence. So all we're left with are a bunch of yeses and nos without any context. I think that was written by someone who just does direct examinations by a prosecutor. And I think that was thrown in there with the intent cut to cut it out. Are you trying to cut it out? I have cut Judge it out. Draper? In the last couple of trials, I've cut it out. They cut it out? Yeah. Are you but serious? the state fought against it. Of course they did. And the judge had to explain to the state, well, no, because if you take out all the questions the attorneys ask on cross-examination, well, you're just left it, with yes and no's. You have to have the context of the question to know what the yes or the no is for. But when you ask a leading question and the juror says yes, that they agree with it, then they've adopted your question, basically. But if you're a juror and you I don't know is... that, you are the most intelligent, well-informed person at this, at this, in this room right now. You know that because you've read case after case after case. You have the years and years of experience. It's just common sense, though. Is it, though? Maybe. If I you're mean, not that, if there's you don't another have part that of the much common sense. And what's the other part of the instruction? What's the other part of the instruction? You know, using your common sense, you know, sure. something like that. I, I get what you're saying. You know, I, I hear you. Um, and there has to be a better way, right? That is one way of doing it. You know, I think that there has to be a better way. Well, you can, we just cut that out because the next sentence in here is that, Evidence consists of the, the testimony of the witnesses and materials admitted in, into the record. So, yeah. like, you just cut well, out those first two sentences that's and all you need. with that. Yeah. You just tell them what evidence is yeah. without telling them what evidence is not. I think it yeah. is helpful to tell people that what the lawyers say is not, because often lawyers will, you know, overpromise and, and, and they will ask, they, they will ask questions that I assume love it. facts not in evidence. You right, made this up, did you? you know. And then you hit yourself. But That's yeah. true. And okay. so, but cross-examinations do that. Well, right? And, right. and so if you don't want someone to consider a fact and not in evidence, which doesn't come out generally in direct examination. Most people don't understand what that objection is. You right. Know? It, and it really is an important objection, right? We it is. all like... But it comes out in cross, that happens more on cross-examination. Right. So if you want to undercut your opponent for their cross-examination questions, then you put this in there that may confuse some jurors who don't maybe come into the jury room with as much common sense as we would like or as other people have. But I think that if you don't understand everything and you don't know that by saying yes or no to something that you adopt the, the underlying predicate of that question, that might confuse you. And that might make you end up disregarding Pretty I much the entire right. defense. I, yeah. yeah, I think you're I think, right. I think it's it's mostly for like opening statement, like you were saying though. Cause I had an appeal where the lawyer got up in opening statement. It was injury to a child, and he promised the jury that this was going to be about reasonable discipline, and you know that yes, he spanked the kid, but it was for a reason. It wasn't too hard, you know. And then the kid testified at trial later that it never even happened, and he made the whole thing up. Ooh. Yeah. It's ouch. How you like them, uh, uh, Judge? Have you s in had to deal with any sort of um, nature of the relationship or forfeiture by wrongdoing kind of stuff in your court? You know anything about I that? I don't think that stuff sucks. I don't think that I've had to deal with that. So it's terrible. Nature of the nature of the relationship in a, in assault family member cases. It, it, they took it. They barred it from the old murder. 
uh, statute where you can talk about the nature of the relationship still subject to the rules of evidence uh, regarding the relationship between person A and person B. And it's not character evidence, it's just other uh, motive, intent. Right, uh, 404B. Right, that's yeah. 404B2. Yeah. Um, is it direct evidence or is it's, it? Dude, it's anything subject, anything subject to basically 404. Um, it's it's pretty crazy, and forfeiture by wrongdoing is pretty terrible too. I don't know if you guys are looking into any of that stuff, but if once the prosecutor's office catches on to nature of the relationship forfeiture by wrongdoing, uh, we got we're gonna have big problems on the defense side. So you mean like you're hoping that none of them are watching? Right? And I'm loving yeah. that I'm not talking yeah. about it. On, yeah. Well, I mean, it's you law. know, we just had um, you know a whole bunch. Like last week was uh, was so-called baby DA school, right? Where all the younger DAs go. Is that where they all training. were? Yeah, that's where they all were. You know, it's funny. We have a baby judge school that was just like just an, an abomination, right? It was, it was. It's like, oh, now I, now I realize why the quality of the judiciary for the ten years I practiced before mm. was so poor across the state because. I went to baby judge school and like they didn't say many of these new judges that were going to this new training, they weren't even on the bench yet, right? They're coming straight from DA's offices, they're coming straight from civil practices, they're coming straight into many of these district courts in smaller counties, you know, handle criminal and civil matters, right? And Harris County is the exception that we separate them. And, you know, not a word about criminal discovery, not a single word. Really? Not a word about suppression, constitutional standards about search and seizure, not a word about it. Um, the only time they talked about criminal cases were to say that, um, and, I, and I'm not exaggerating, right, that criminal defendants are, um, and I use that term intentionally talking about the program, right? Criminal sure. defendants are never show to court, and it's a huge problem and that they're trying to kill you. You personally, you judge, you listening to this, criminal defendant's trying to kill you. Is this right? where we're supposed to use the shocked expression on TV? Like, No, 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 that's later, that's later. Oh, but <laughs> who, who's, who's teaching this? So it's funny you ask that. Um, <laughs> it's taught by, believe it or not, a former um, Harris County uh, criminal court judge named Mark Atkinson, who was court, mm. court 13 judge for many yeah. years and who uh, like cornered me at the coffee urn one day when I like blew off a morning to get on a conference call uh, regarding the O'Donnell bail lawsuit about dismantling the system that he helped build. And uh, so I took the morning off of class and he cornered me at the coffee urn uh, to talk about how- I heard about that. That was, not, that was out in Austin or something? <laughs> wait, yeah, that was in what? Austin. Yeah, I heard but about, about how, that. how disrespectful it was yeah. for me to blow off a morning of a right. five day CLE. And I'm like, look, man, I, I'm, I'm busy. You know, Dude, I'm busy with, with problems you gave created, me. Created, right. How, yeah. How is it standing up to, because you've taken some positions that are 180 well, from some in the last 20 years. Can you hold on for that second? Because sure. I've actually been thinking a lot. I was, um, I had a client in my office, so I was ruling a little bit late. I had a client in my office, and I wanted to ask a judge about just the timing of a docket tomorrow, and I happened to have his cell phone from before he was a judge. And I held back, because I was like, I don't know if this is appropriate or inappropriate. And... I assumed in my mind that you, when y'all go off to that training, that they cover things like, here's how to be appropriate with your friends who you're going to be practicing in your court, and here's how to handle 3914 under the Code of Criminal Procedure. And you're saying that basically- That would have been great. Absolutely no, none of that there, happened. There were some weird cutouts in the back table with the coffee of like uh, of like a Bible verse about oh do unto God. Israelites as you would do unto other Israelites or, or something uh, along that. <laughs> oh. those, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry I'm watching the Bible on television, you know, but it was, it was something about Israelites and, and it's just like, that is amazing. It was it it was astonishing to me the the poor quality Who of. Who puts of, it? So Atkinson was like the course director, or it's, a it's speaker, the Texas or? Center for the Judiciary, and that is grant funded by the Court of Criminal Appeals. And it's so. well, but it wasn't your weren't your classes mostly about civil practice? Everything a lot is of them civil centric. It was very civil centric, and it was just like oh, criminal cases. It's just like they're trying to kill you, and they never show up to court. It's just like a, it's it's like a nuisance almost, right? And. Uh, I will shocking. say one story about this that, that I that I love. My favorite story about baby DA school is baby that, or school. baby judge school, I'm so sorry, because we started yo, about baby yo, DA school, yo. is um, I sat at the table with many of the new Harris County criminal court judges, right? And I am so glad to to be in the minority, right, with um, like a number of like colleagues who are people of color, and I was sitting at the table with them, because they're my friends. and. 
they told the story that the topic was recusal, right? And, it, and, and so somebody told the story like, well, you know, when you get that phone call, you ought to, you ought to pick it up, you ought to answer. It's a, it's a hassle, but it might change your life. Let me tell you a story about a case I took in a county where the DA got a wrongful conviction, but then it turns out that he was now a judge and the whole county was conflicted out, right? Oh, yeah. if, if you're yeah. in the know, you know what I'm talking yeah. about, right? And we did too. And he was like, and, and it turns out that I presided over the, the exoneration of Michael Morton, and who is the, the wrongfully convicted person in Georgetown, Texas, Williamson County, that the discovery law that we have, the strong discovery law in Texas we have is named after him. And he was like, and that prosecutor who wrongfully convicted him, he lost his bench and he was disbarred. And from our table of Harris County judges, I started a round of applause yeah, yeah. At, at Ken Anderson being disbarred. Yes. And I, and I looked over at them and, and there was just like this like reluctant applause, this no. re uncomfortable reluctant applause started like spilling out across the room. And I looked at my colleagues and I said, you know, we just started probably the first round of applause for Ken Anderson being disbarred uh, in the history of baby judge school. Well, and should, good. That's awesome. Shouldn't that be something? Yeah, that, that is applauded. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. yes, man. <laughs> how have you been? How have you have you how have you dealt with um, the realities of being a judge? With, in my opinion, would be reasonable views like a fair system, but would be considered radical. Uh, you know, a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, you've been nationally publicized about your views. You've been you were a hotly contested bench uh, in County Criminal Court at Law Number Eight. Um, how have you, what have you been able to do personally to, to make it through? And what are some of the challenges that you see, uh, on the horizon that for criminal justice, I don't know, I'm not gonna say reform cause I don't think that maybe that's not your platform at all, but it is radical or changing, uh, what used to be, uh, the norm. People like it. Well, how have you been able to deal with that, man? I mean, the day to day. I got to say, and this, this goes back to the bringing up baby DA school last week, right? It's, it's like the day-to-day -day in my court, I hope, I, I think, talking to litigants, right, is like everyone's treated well, right? Prosecutors treated well, defense lawyers treated well. Most, most of all, people charged are treated well. Um, staff are treated well. So, like, you know, there was all this worry about, oh, the big bad, you know. I mean, I remember when I first met Kim Og, I'd never met her before. Uh, we went to some, like, dinner, and uh, she comes up to me and she says, wow, you know, Franklin Bynum, I hear you're going to tear it all down. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, but she's like, well, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to wait and see what it, what, what it means. And I was like, well, better not to worry. That's what my therapist tells me. <laughs> and so, you know, like... The day to day of, of like like we were talking about last week, the line prosecutors, right, is I, I think probably pretty good. I mean, they went to D, baby DA school. And I was just like, y'all don't ruin my reputation, right, by saying that it's actually a good place to practice, right? right. Talk about how horrible I am. <laughs> um, you know, I, it, the way it's done, right, the way that I accomplish the larger things that I talk about in places like this and, and out uh, in, in the world is just day to day treating people well, right? And, and it's easy. There was an article written about you uh, regarding something about abolishing prisons. Was it prisons or jails? It's prison abolition, right? Okay, yeah, prison, prison abolition. Abolition. Ab abolition. Yes. What does that mean and, and, and where are you going with that? Prison abolition is a big idea that has roots in the larger abolitionist movement that we're all familiar with, right? The abolition of slavery, right? Prison abolition is the idea that um, and the way I explain to people in the courthouse is this. We deploy police and prosecutors towards social problems that we should not, that, that police and prosecutors are not equipped to handle. And so one of my colleagues came in when we were at the Family Law Center, this temporary building, and I had this great panoramic view of the whole jail complex. Now I have a window view of it. And I said, look, if I could wave my hands and get rid of this jail complex, I would, right? It's not any way for us to live together. It's not. But I can't do that, right? What I can do is uh, talk to people about what we're doing and why it's wrong, day to day, treat people well, put it into action, and say this is the wrong solution to this, this is the wrong solution to this DWI second, this is the wrong solution to this PCS case, possession control substance case. 
and, and day to day do it and show people that it is the wrong solution. And in a larger sense, we need to redirect resources from very, very expensive police and prosecutors towards giving people housing, giving people health care. Like I, one of the taglines, one of the like, like the, the put it on a bumper sticker ways to say it is people need care, not cages. Mm -hmm. Sure. And that's what prison abolition is, right? In a larger sense, prison abolition is a goal. And if we, if we go at this system and we stop deploying police and prosecutors for mental illness, for poverty, for any number of other social problems, what we're going to be left with is not prisons as we know them. Right. That is prison abolition. Right. And it's not some shrunk down version of the system. It is an elimination of this system. This system is a continuation of some of the worst, most shameful practices uh, of our country and of our history, of our people, of everything. Right. And we have to stop it. And it's a it's a big task. And a lot of people blanch at the term abolition. Right. A prison abolition. Right. As if we're going to like go there with an axe and, you know, with it with cut open the gates. Right. And open the floodgates. No, right? It is changing the way we live, changing the way we think about punishment, retribution, and, and peeling these things back and building a better world for ourselves. It, I, it didn't used to always be this way. Um, so like right now, and you know, for a long time, prison abolition seemed so radical and like it would change everything. But in the 40s and 50s, like that was mainstream thought. And if you look at the you know, the incarcerated population, um, it wasn't until like the, you know, the 60s, the war on drugs, that it really skyrocketed. But before then, like it was, you know, it was low and it was going down. And so prison abolition was actually mainstream academic thought. Nobody thought it was crazy. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's happened in other places in the world. You mean to tell me that if instead of incarcerating these, in, these individuals we could maybe educate them and teach them and they would come out in our society and actually produce so that's insane so, so well, we well had produce a, some, <laughs> some capitalists but i mean but, or, or just like, like yeah yeah you know be normal <laughs> like be like live among us right i mean we all as a defense lawyer i did i mean the instances of people that like truly truly right that we can't live with that can't make it out here for whatever reason real low you know, I mean, everyone's so afraid of, of like, oh, what about, you know, what about the murders, right? Well, the recidivism rate for murder is real yeah. low. Yeah, that's you know, true. it's very traumatic to kill someone else. Mm -hmm. um, most people do it, uh, you know, it kind of in the heat of a moment or something, not excusing it, right? But then to compound the harm, right, in a way that in many ways ripples out far greater. You know, we, we need to take a step back and look at, what we're doing to ourselves as a society. In other countries, they don't give these high sentences. Like in Australia, they would give sure. 14 years for murder and everybody thought that that was a super long time. That is, a, is long a long time. It is a long that time, a long but in time. America, it's like, you know, that's a but, slap on the wrist, which is insane. And okay, okay, so like we have this idea that we've been batting around. All right, so like in the UK, um, when the police respond to a situation, Instead of, like in, in Harris County, when they, you know, respond to a disturbance or whatever, they call the DA's office and tell them what's going on and ask them if they're going to accept criminal charges. But like in Europe, instead of calling the DA's office, they call a completely separate agency. They explain the situation and that agency sends them to, you know, family services, children's services, mental health care, hospital, you know whatever social services the situation calls for, and it's only a very small percentage of the cases that actually get referred for criminal prosecution. Mm. Right, I, I mean... It just makes so much sense. And the thing it is, it's really important, it's, it's such an important point, because so much of the reform we've done in Harris County has gone so fast because we have such a centralized system. And one of the ways that our system here in Harris County is the most centralized is what's called DA intake. When it doesn't work this way in other cities. The, the police officer calls a DA from the street and says, hey, I got this person here. Self-checkout at Walmart, sit-go parking lot, or, you know, somebody got stabbed and, and I think this might be the guy, right? And let me tell you why. And the DA actually on the phone accepts or rejects those charges against that person. 
So, so the DA, in ways far greater than other cities, enacts personal supervision of street police conduct. And so, you know, what if we were just to divert that line that the county controls, right, the commissioner's court controls, to somewhere else? Why should the DA get all those calls, right? Why, don't, why doesn't someone else get the calls and then decide if the DA, they'll forward it to the DA if that's what's appropriate. Well, if you don't get the calls, you can't ask for the money. Right. And they, yeah, they do, they do like to do that. Come in peace. Call 713-807-1794. Catch us on Twitter at at HCCLA underscore dot org. Seven underscore five. org, no dot. Oh, Twitter at HCCLA underscore org. Come on, hit us up with Honorable Judge Franklin, Justin Harris, Sarah V. Wood. So I want to give you a little bit of bad news about the, what you were saying about um, abolition, prison abolition. So the JPC, which we talked, you talked about last week and how there's, it's no longer, it's, it's not ideal, but it's not a, a dungeon anymore, a literal dungeon, I think is what you said, like the IPC was. So. I had a client who was taken into custody yesterday. We knew what was going on, and he called last night, uh, well, a free call from the JPC. He hadn't been, he'd been in the system a long time, or quite a bit, a long time ago. And he called last night just to tell me how great and wonderful the JPC is, <laughs> and how it's just awesome. And he was just kicking it, watching TV, and things have really improved. Um, he didn't even tell me, like, I've got to get out of here. So when, you, so, so when they go and be like, wow. hey, bro, you want to take the time serve? He's like, nah. I'm Can you get like good, another man. weekend? I'm good, I'm good. Hey, no, right, no, no, so no, let's no, talk no. about Nobody wants to be in jail. Let's but, nobody, nobody does. And the thing is, but I But that is a marked to, improvement. I did want to tell you that. Thank that, you. You know, it, it is uncomfortable for me being having the feelings that I feel, you know, to, to speak about a jail, a cage, in the way that I would speak about the JPC. It is an incremental improvement. Right, and I'm I'm glad to be here for it in a building that I have a blue badge and I can beep, you know, it opens gates and I can use my signature to free people from it. Right, that is a big improvement from people being not just at the IPC county-owned dungeon, but maybe being under the control of HPD before at a jail that I don't have a blue badge. Right, HPD is not going to let me into their jail to free people. Right, they're not interested in that, but. Now it's a building that I have access to and it is an improvement. But the thing is, I look forward to the time that the JPC is like a community center or a high school because it's probably the same architect as a high school. Have, did you see the chief of police or whoever it was yelling at the judges about letting people out on, on violent crime, on low bonds and such? And then they said the, the amount of the bond and I thought it was completely fair and reasonable. Uh, did y'all hear about that? I mean, it's all over the it news. It was 50,000, right? Yeah. yeah, I was like, dude, I, I thought, Fifty thousand. What was the case? Um, it, he ended up uh, shooting somebody. The accusation is some, he somebody shot another individual in the face while on bond on some other. Type the bond of schedule back in the day, you know, capped out at about thirty-five k, thirty-five fifty k for anything, you know, yeah. murder, sort of capital murder, you know. It's it's um, if you. This is the wrong thinking, thinking in terms of release tied to a dollar amount, right? This mm -hmm. is this is the old thinking. Right. And when whenever, you know, it, it believe me, it doesn't surprise me that that law enforcement, even in the higher ranks, right, does not understand the law and the Constitution. Right. They don't. It, it has nothing to do with a money amount. And in fact, if you if if you do what 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 they say and you just like it make ever increasing amounts, who are the only people who, who can afford uh, 200K, 300K, 500K bond? Rich people. Well, or really, or really, really good criminals, or or right, like people, like like people, really like like out. organized crime, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, not to not not to concede any of these things exist as they allege it or any, sure. but but yeah, right? It's like people like Robert Durst who who were born with a whole bunch of money, right? And people who are who who are in who are in business, right? And so what they are saying benefits like. The people that they would say are the worst, right? Right. Yeah. At, at the expense of the the normal, like regular people here who are caught up in the system, the law, and the constitu constitution says they're innocent. It, it's outrageous to tie these things to money. It's archaic. It, it is. It is hundred year old it, thinking. It makes absolutely no sense. I mean, there is, you know, no one can. If anybody can explain, please tell me, like, 
how is it, okay, I mean, like the two points, the two, you know, factors to consider in bail is safety of the community. Is the community going to be safe if this person is released while they're waiting for trial? And are they going to show back up for court? Those are the two things that you have to consider when deciding whether to release somebody. How is it going to make you any more likely to come to court or any more likely to not commit another offense to pay $5,000 to a bondsman? Okay. Right. Doesn't. So, I mean, like, you know, if you're you, never going to get that five thousand dollars back, you're never going to get it back. Like but, maybe if you were paying it directly to the county and they were actually holding it as yeah. a deposit for your appearance, that would make you more likely to go to court, knowing that you would get that money back. But giving it to a bondsman takes all of the logic completely out of this system. whole county, myself included, is living paycheck to paycheck. You know. That is how people live. We, it's not like you have some gold in the back and you got to put the gold up to, to secure your, your freedom, right? That's not the world we live in. We're all living paycheck to paycheck. So let's talk, okay, so let's talk about it. We, there's a big deal, big deals going on, settlement talks, so settlement, si signatures on the paper, big bail lawsuit. Is it finally over? Where are we at now? It's just about over. So to give some background, um, a few years ago, the county was sued in a case called O'Donnell versus Harris County. Miranda O'Donnell is the name of the person who um, is a representative of a larger class of people who was detained in the Harris County Jail because they couldn't afford to pay to get out. And we took over the system in January, and I think we talked a little, about it, a little bit about it last week, and made some temporary changes to end that system of wealth-based detention. And we did it through the local rules and, and on and check the YouTube for the details. But what we were in court today for was this was the, as a criminal defense lawyer would put it, the um, plea or trial setting, right? This was the no more resets, the like work this case out or not setting. And we have been working round the clock to make the temporary changes we made part of a larger scheme of permanent changes that will make sure that no one in Harris County ever again is locked up because they can't afford to pay to get out on a misdemeanor. And we went in and I'm so happy to say that our lawyers announced on our behalf that we have reached a settlement in principle. It'll be on the commissioner's court agenda this Tuesday and that we did it. Do you have any uh, highlights that you can share with us for this agreement in principle that will be before the commissioner's court? It's a big, big document. Okay. Some of the highlights that might be interesting to people, um, aside from locking in permanently the changes, local rules guaranteeing release for people, is we are going to um, provide more support services to defense lawyers. You know, right now the county courts maintain a list of lawyers that you can get appointed a lawyer. We're going to start maintaining lists of investigators, lists of social workers, lists of help that defense lawyers can access without a lot of the red tape that has been in existence before, right? We're cutting out the red tape and saying, if you need help, here is help. And these are social workers not to help the lawyer with their personal struggles, these yeah. are them to help yeah. their clients. Right, right. They're and, investigators and, to help investigate their cases and experts to help investigate. These are people to help the defendants, right? Yes, yes, people to help the defendants. Um, you know, we're, we're re-characterizing a lot of the settings, right? It's a big problem in the courthouse that we're jamming people into the courthouse that don't need to be there. So we're, we're setting into letters that for certain types of kind of intermediate kind of like, you know, settings, court settings that are not important for people to be there, we're just putting into the letter that if an attorney shows up, that's good enough. Awesome. Really? Yes. So like, appearances don't have to really be waived as long as there's an attorney there. The appearance is made. The appearance is made. Right. Right. That's exactly that's for for most of the for most of the what we call non-issue settings. You, right. What else? Wow, so much, so much. I mean, you realize that you're for, revolutionizing this kind of stuff. You're on the forefront. We're doing it. Yeah, we're leading the country. Amazing, I think. It's a national model. Yeah, is national it? Okay, model. talk to me about that. It's a national model. It's been used in uh, nas nationally. Well, so who, in who came up standard. with it? We, so the thing is, this has not really been done before. Right. Uh, and definitely not at this scale. And we so are the national model. We are. Yeah. We in Harris County are the national model We're setting in, the, in the county courts. We are. And that's why it took so long. Here we are in July with our, with our, with our do or die setting. And it's because, look, uh, we went down to the wire. Imagine, too, that, that plaintiffs and defendants, people suing us, 
you know, I, I, we, were, we, we ran for office. I ran for office to be a defendant in this case, to negotiate with people that I shared values with. And it still took us seven months because the details, because we don't have a model to look to, except for what we made on the fly implementing the rules and that was informed and, and our permanent decisions were informed by the temporary changes we made. So it was all this just like over and over. It is gonna revolutionize. Let's talk the, about oh, the, the solution to bail reform is not just, oh, judges have to consider your financial condition before they can set bail. It's not just, oh, they have to set bail at an amount that you can afford. Like the Fifth Circuit found that Harris County had intentionally engaged in you know, systemic violations of civil rights, equal protection due process, you know, for decades. And so in order to actually dismantle that whole system, there's many different parts of it. I mean, like the bond forfeitures is one thing. So, you know, now Harris County is going to have to make rules to where they're not able to coerce pleas by, you know, because it used to be if you were five minutes late to court, uh, the state would move for bond forfeiture, the judge would forfeit your bond, and as soon as you showed up late, you would be in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. On trial day. Or, or yeah. shackles. Shackles. You'd be in, in chains, and they would say, well, if you plead guilty right now, you don't have to go to jail. Can, can, can I speak Mark? to that? That, 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 is, that is like, it, it, it's really close to my heart, that charade of the state's motion for bond forfeiture. That, Shut up. Stay, hey, stay with the bond forfeiture. I just want to oh, and, that's, and I remember there was one judge who would be like, and that's so granted yeah. every single time. Oh, and yeah. that's granted. That'll be and granted. Just, and that'll be granted. Hell yeah. Uh. There's no such motion in the code. There's no such thing as a state's motion for bond forfeiture. There's just not, right? And, and so, like, as much as I hate using the courts for roll call, I was actually brought around to, like, let's know who's here, you know, like, like that's, like, that's not, as long as you take the coercive and, and, and punitive part out of the docket call that actually just like, hey, who's here, right, in an organized way is okay, but, but we cut out the state's motion for bond forfeiture, you know, it's just like, no, we're not, we're not making motions that don't exist anymore to kind of like, for the DA to assert their power in the courtroom, right, well, you don't have it, right, not, not about this. I would love to hear, that'll be denied. Say, yeah, well, that'll be or, denied. Or we'll hold on that. Yeah. I mean, I mean well, how, how, how hard is it to do this job well, to, to like be like, all oh, right, well, I'm not going to say right now because I don't know. Right? <laughs> I'm just calling a roll. I don't have enough to rule on a motion. L let's talk so about... I've been, I've been playing with this a little bit. And I've had some cases where my client's appearance is waived and their appearance, that decision was made two months before that court date, right? I'm show up on that court date. And two months ago, the state and I, the prosecutor for the state and I approached the judge and I said, judge, I'd like to waive my client's appearance in this next setting. I don't need him here. We're waiting on something that's gonna take three months to come back and courts in two months. The judge with the prosecutor standing next to me says, yeah, that's fine with me. Prosecutors, I got no objection. We all sign the reset. We write that on the reset. Pre-trial calls. And then, yeah, and then, um, no, two months later, we show up for court. We have, we're gonna deal with the pre-trial question yeah, next week. It's a big problem, um, but, judge. But then two months later, we show up, same people are all in the courtroom, that same prosecutor, the same judge and me, the judge calls the name. The prosecutor, understandably, has forgotten two months ago that they agreed to waive the setting. The name doesn't get responded to. I may be not, maybe I'm not in the courtroom at that moment. State, just robotically, state moves for bond forfeiture. Well, you waived his appearance previously. Isn't there a rule against making frivolous motion, knowingly making frivolous motions or knowingly filing frivolous pleadings in a court? They and, wouldn't know, and, though. But they were the ones standing right next to me, and they agreed to it. We should tag them. But we they should don't put a post in around their face. Okay, but does the law say it's a defense if you file a frivolous motion accidentally? I don't know. No. I don't think it does. And I also... They're taught wrong. They're they are often taught, wrong. taught wrong. And they're, the reason you ask them why they're doing that, and they say, it's, I was, my chief told me to. Right. In fact, I was in court four a few, a few months ago, and Judge Baldwin, who's very smart, recognized that there's this thing as bond forfeiture, and instructed the state, if you're gonna do this, I can't tell you not to, you need to be saying state moves for bond revocation, which even to my ears is just like jarring. And she was sitting there, state moves for bond revocation, and she was getting like sneers and snickers from other attorneys who were giving her, she's like, this is what I'm supposed to say, the judge told me to. But she's actually doing it, if you're gonna do it, the right way. 
That, um, is, that is the thing that, that they can arguably move for. Yeah. Uh, that, you can move right. for whatever you want. But, and you know, what's funny is that at an institutional level, the DA's office will complain bitterly about the difference between, and, and this is getting really in the weeds, I'm sorry. Uh, That's my fault. I like, I like getting in the weeds. You know, it, it's, it's, when you don't show up for court, right, there are two options for a judge um, that are, that are, adverse options. There are other options like resetting the case for a couple weeks to let the person surface or not and then take some adverse action or not. But, you know, it's funny that they that they will bitterly complain. It's just like, oh, we want you to forfeit the bond, not revoke it. And it's like, well, the law gives me two options. Mm -hmm. If both apply, right, if, if it's like a Venn diagram, right? Like, if, if both apply, I it would seem that I get my choice of which one to use and, you know, you can complain all you want, but yet, yeah, institutionally, they really want forfeitures because they... They get to go after people for the money. They get to go after people for money, right? And, and they, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't know. We, they've come to our judges meeting before and complained about this and, and like, we, we read in the riot act about it. So let's talk about some things. Let's, let's switch it up. Some of the, some of the new things that are going on. How about, let's talk about sight and release. Okay. So currently in Harris County, you get arrested, you get coughed, you get arrested and you get sent to the new, uh, joint processing center. You chill and watch some TVs. I'm kidding. You get arrested and you get locked up. Um, other counties, in Texas do something called side and release. And for the last 50 years, giving somebody a ticket or a summons to go to court is was just preposterous and they can't be done for these low level type offenses. In about other words- About 20 years, about 20 years. About 20 years. So let's say you're, it's a low level misdemeanor, uh, cop sees you, you get arrested and go to court, drive my license out or something. I don't know exactly what it would apply to. Uh, currently you get arrested for that stuff and you, and you go to jail. Um, and, but instead of that happening now, you're going to get a, a date, like you get a traffic ticket and says you have to show up to court on this date. Uh, is that my understanding with this new site and release program that they're rolling out? Uh, what uh, offenses does it apply to? Accusations does it apply to? And when will it start? And who has to agree for that? To, who all has to agree for that to be able to be possible? That is, these are, that is a great specific question, you know, and the general question is, the legislature authorized certain offenses can be disposed of or can be initiated by a ticket, right? Like we were saying last week, self-checkout at the Walmart, class B level, graffiti, possession of marijuana, uh, which they say they're not arresting people for to start with, but you know, the numbers I've are what they are. They need to, like, yeah, they, I, got, I have a ton of marijuana cases right now. Right. It's most class Bs. Oh, you have a ton of marijuana cases, then those are getting dismissed. They should be. Until, but, but, the, but they, they, there's no policy or, or directive to anyone. There is policy. It's, uh, it changes uh, for, uh, for I think for arrest, right? like for more new, uh, re, no, new arrests, but we're talking pending cases. Yeah. These, these people are stuck in limbo, and, and I'm just sending them for trial, because I know they're going to dump them at some point. But the district attorney, at least through their office, hasn't let their line prosecutors know what they're going to do with these pending marijuana cases. Oh, because the offense is before the hemp law? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, site and release is going to be, we're going to create the infrastructure for, pe for police agencies to opt into this. And I can tell you, the sheriff's office on board, right? Because their partner's out on the street. Their partner's also... In court, right? They're good partners. The sheriff's office are great partners. They they want they don't want their j jail to be full up of people that shouldn't be in jail, right? And they're they responsible know. for the JPC right. for the they're, more humane treatment. That's they're the responsible. sheriff's office. They are they they do great work. They're great partners, right? And so I guarantee you, there'll be a launch agency, right? We're going to create the capacity for people to write tickets, and it'll be up to the agencies, right? So you know when you see hashtag relational policing. Ask what that means, right? I don't know what it means, right? Does it mean um, easing up in the way that everyone wants you to ease up? Uh, you know, it'll be up to them to tell us. So we are going to create the capability for people to do the thing that they're waiting for at the JPC. You're waiting in the waiting room. You got to wait to be printed. You got to be wait to see the judge. You got to wait to, to talk to talk to a defense lawyer, right? We're just going to do that where you, you don't have to go downtown and spend 24 hours in jail. You can show up to court and then wait to be printed real fast.
go to the go see the judge and 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 get your case on track without disrupting your life in a way that the law and the constitution say you're innocent. That's right? amazing. Have why should why should your life be disrupted? Have you uh, are the particulars worked out on that? Every week we, it, it 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 is every week we're working about it. We're working on it, right? And working on the details. One of the things in the settlement actually is this thing called open hours court where if somebody misses court, we're going to publish that one day a week, we're going to start out at one day a week, uh, there's going to be a court that you go to, like a standing hours court. Nice. If you want to get your bond reinstated, if Amazing. you want to explain what's happening, you got one place to go. You can always go to the court you're assigned at the time, any day, sure. and say, hey, sorry I missed court. But there's also going to be a place you can go just to resolve your business without going back to jail. Because people never know what to do when they miss court. They're just so afraid. We're trying to make it simple. We're like trying to make annex it accessible. Court at the city of Houston. Exactly like you the show annex up, you court. go to that window, they put you on the annex docket, and you go down at nine thirty at night and talk to that judge. And will there be right. who will be who will be running that bench? Right yeah. now, um, there were many iterations of it over time. Right, right now, what it's going to be, it's going to be a revolving kind of just like when you show up, they'll tell you what. What court's on that day? Is it court eight? Go up to courtroom 11 4. Be like right? a warrant duty or something? Yeah, kind of like that. And, you know, I have hopes that it'll grow into something that even the magistrates can do, right? That give them some free world docket experience, you know, not just hold off in the jail. I think that'll make for better magistrates if we give them different settings and, and mix it up a little bit and, and treat them like judges because they are judges, right? And so. You know, it, it is a way that we are planting a seed to make a better system. We are making a better system today, but we're also planning to make a better system into the future. So let me let me ask some specifics if you know the answer and if you can say. So let's say uh, I get I get arrested, or I get detained. I guess it would be by a loss prevention officer when I skip scan some things at the Walmart self checkout, and I you know it's one hundred fifty dollars. It's Class B misdemeanor shoplifting theft. Um, the officer shows up. There has to be some coordination between the law enforcement agency and the DA's office because the DA's office still has to file the charges, right? So the way it'll work, yes, you're so right. The way it'll work is they'll have rules b baked into their ticket systems like they have now for traffic tickets in municipal court and JP court, right? That They're like, all these ticket machines have these rules built in. This is like, well, if you're in precinct four, then it's the second Friday after such and such, right? right? And that's just the day you go. And then later, they give the paperwork to the prosecuting agency, be it the city attorney, the district attorney. And that's the way it'll work. They'll gather the information. They will submit it to the DA's office at a later date. And the DA's office will then have the time and the luxury to get all their papers together instead of being rushed down while someone's detained on a plastic seat at the, J at the Joint Processing Center. They'll be able to you know, take their time to a certain extent and then file the case when the person shows up to court is the idea, mm -hmm. right? Is when the person shows up, then, and if they don't show up, then guess what? The case is being filed anyway, and then now they have a warrant out, or they have a summons out, or they have something out. We're working out the details. But it just ba takes a process that is too fast and too punitive right now and just breaks it up and slows it down and says, hey, you know, Here's your notice to appear in court two, three weeks from now, whatever, and you know we'll get our paperwork together in the meantime. It Re benefits everyone. Reasonable, thought out system. It takes time to do. It that's, takes time to. That's to, just too I radical. I think that's great. That's I too radical, man. That's just too crazy. Writing tickets. That's yeah, too crazy, tickets. man. Well, my yeah. only crazy. The, I, I do have a concern. Is that you know when. Things have a tendency to get erased, certain recordings and things like that. And that's one thing that my office tries to do is within 24 hours in some case, in a lot of cases, we are issuing letters and you know, preservation letters and trying to get subpoenas ready. And if certain counties that operate that way on just regular charges, they arrest them, book them in on a probable cause affidavit, and then give them a bond, let them out. And then two months later is our court date. Sometimes those people don't start calling attorneys for two months. And... And now I guess that's on the defendant, right? They got to know they got to step up real quick. I got this site and release ticket. I don't have court for two weeks or two months or whatever, but I need a lawyer to get on this now and start preparing my defense because the prosecutor, while they may be taking their time, they're preparing the prosecution, right? 
theoretically. I'm yeah. not saying that's yeah. a reason not to do this at all. I, the I greater hear you. good it's is public far. education. I hear yeah. you. I mean, yeah. Stuff like that is it's on our. You we'll, know. we'll adapt. Well, we'll figure out a way to get that stuff taken care of. But I, I hear you that slowing down the process that there are things, there are videos, there are surveillance videos and things that are destroyed over time, and and it'll be something we have to work out. You know, but but for the for now, I think not caging someone, not having people miss. Picking That's up their kid better. from school or whatever. Better. No, but you're right that that is a concern and something we gotta we gotta figure out how to do. One of the things we're working on with Manage Assigned Council, right, which is some something we didn't, you know, that it's, it's the a, only a lot we, to talk we, about. We get their marijuana and pro tems. We got thirty seconds. Stay so you have thirty break. seconds. So so we can we can appoint lawyers earlier in the process as we professionalize the apparatus to appoint them and take it out sure. of the hands of judges, right? The MAC will absolutely be able to do that. That's a great idea. So the idea is is that more lawyers, better funded lawyers, lawyers with more resources that are appointed earlier in the case by professional staff. That's that's put it on a bumper sticker. That's the MAC. That Return is the managed sign counsel plan. Mac. Na, 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 na. For Judge Franklin Bynum, the trial warrior, Justin Harris, and extraordinary lawyer, PDO, amazing advocate, Sarah V. Wood, unreasonable doubt, we love you. Look up. Looking up. Good we've been kicking show. some butt. Yeah, we're, good we've, show. Yeah, we've been kicking, yeah, really great good show. show. My, hot mic. PDO's kicking butt, getting not guilty. Justin Harris is getting You're not getting guilty. Not hey man, you... Judge Bynum is seating the juries and changing the system. Trying to put love into action, you know, love. Put, and the law into action for the first time around here. It is bold. It is strong. Defense bar, keep it up. I love you guys. Yeah, so that <laughs> whole national model thing—that's some pressure, right? Because if. Yeah, we got to make it go right. Then the everybody else is, say, "No, we're not doing what Harris County did down in Texas." That's right. But the thing is, like, we're gonna do it. You will you know? do it. You'll get it right. You got the best people in there right now to do Isn't this. That awesome? Your right. name's all over it. Yeah, that's there right. It is. In the, there it Judge is. Judge Bynum is all over that stuff, man. We the people on the Love settlement. It. I assume you have to sign it somewhere. I do have to sign it. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. <laughs> it's all yeah. Keep hey, it we can read. Hey, we should read Rule Nine on yeah. uh, uh, July Fourth of July. Yeah, we should read Local <laughs> Rule Nine on the Fourth of read July. Read Rule Nine. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Bail reform rule. Yeah. yeah. I love it. No, we'll, we'll oh, read that every year on the date of the settlement. <laughs> yeah. 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 That'll be a new holiday. Somebody will be like. I get Franklin Bynum's name. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Franklin yeah. Bynum. Franklin Bynum. <laughs> yeah. Toria Finch. <laughs> Lee, Harper Lee Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Cedric Will Walker. Genesis Draper. Daryl Jordan. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be Daryl Jordan's cool. name. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yay, I got Judge Jordan. Yeah, people would be like, yay, I got Judge Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I hope people saw your shoes. Oh I know. yeah, I, was I saying, know. You yeah, you put Houston, your shoes right there in front of that Houston camera. Edition uh, Air Max uh, are... 97s. Yeah, um, love them. Mike still, is still, still hot. Still hot. How? <laughs> still hot. When did when did those come out? I don't I know. I've seen recently. This... Okay. Uh, but I got them on sale. They have the area code on them. I'm yeah, that's right. Both. Got seven one three on one tongue, two eight one on the other. I think I need some of those. Do they yeah. come in other colors? No, this is the only colors. Mm -hmm. Are we still hot? Yeah.